we are live once again. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night. My name is Michael Waite, and we are here for another episode of the OpenShift Commons Briefings Operator Hours. We have, we have Yair Cohen from uh, Datadog. He's a product manager, and we're going to be talking about containers and ecosystem trends. How are you this morning? Hey, Michael, I'm good. We should say. Uh, thanks. It's great to be here. We're both we're both East Coast. You're in New York, in Brooklyn, right? Right. I'm Brooklyn. It's no longer snowing here. No, no, no. You were um when we were trying to do the dry run for for the, this 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 conversation, you were down in Texas somewhere, and we had to reschedule a couple times. What happened down there? A little, little bit. Yeah. Of snow. Finally decided to take a short trip after uh, you know many months at home and uh, wanted to get away after the freezing cold of New York, so we made it all the way to Texas and um, got stuck in another storm. Apparently, so much for uh, being in the desert. How, um, how much snow? Where, where did you go in Texas? I was in Austin for the first time, which is a really great city. It, what I it is. I, I've been down there a couple times for like DockerCon used to be there, and I think KubeCon they had down at the convention center one time. Uh, yeah, how long next time you, go, you can visit Elon Musk. How long did you get stuck there for? That was a week. My flight was canceled three times, uh, and I got lucky on the fourth. Oh wow! You could have maybe just taken a taken a bus or something to get out of there, but yeah, considered all the options. Well, we're glad that you made it back. Um, Thank you. I hope for everyone who lives in Texas that they now have power and and water back. Um, that was definitely. Yeah, we're uh, Red Hat just Red Hat just donated I think ten or twenty thousand dollars to the American Red Cross to help out down there. Um, oh, that's amazing. Yeah, yeah. So you work at Datadog, and I do. Uh, tell tell us about tell us about Datadog. It's certainly one of the more uh, you know sexy software companies that's out there these days. Tell us about tell us about Datadog. Yeah, well, I work at Datadog, uh, which is a SaaS monitoring and security platform um, where we really like try to be containers first, cloud agnostic. Um, been a pretty exciting journey so far. I think we started the company about uh, almost 10 years ago. Um, I joined a year and a half ago. Um, and, you know, every year we're releasing new products, um, focusing a lot now also on security. Uh, it's been very exciting, uh, you know, given all the changes that are happening now with the digital transformation that was really accelerated by an order of magnitude over the past year, as well as, you know, um, a lot of a lot of the modern cloud native technologies that are appearing there, which is more of my focus. Um, and we're really trying to like basically break the silos between teams, make the you know experience of running applications more efficient uh, and, and more effective, and really bringing everybody together, uh, devs, ops, and security analysts, as well as like business uh, decision makers and, and essentially everybody. Now, you know, when I asked you the other day, I was like, oh, okay, so Datadog, that's that's APM, right? That's application performance monitoring. And you're like, no, 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 Mike, it's 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 much 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 more than that. It, you folks are, are pretty pretty diversified as far as the types of uh, software that you guys are making these days, right? Exactly. Yeah. I mean, we started Datadog uh, as a monitoring platform that was focused on infrastructure monitoring and metrics. Uh, or time series database. Later on, we launched our uh, logs management product, as well as uh, application performance monitoring. But Datadog is really a platform. It's a unified platform where, like, you, we make it easy to correlate between all these types of telemetries and jump from one section to another. It's not really different products. It's a unified experience. Uh, and ever, you know, over the past few years, we continue to launch. New products such as like network performance monitoring, um, pro continuous profiling, security monitoring, compliance monitoring, all things monitoring. But aren't there? So, so I, I work I work with a lot of software companies who certify their their products and their offerings on on Red Hat, uh, you know, Red Hat Enterprise Linux, Ansible, OpenStack, OpenShift. It seems like there's 
no shortage of you know companies who do what you do out there um what makes you guys better than you know name you know any of the others yeah i mean i think that the last the last year right with uh the, the unfortunate events of covid and, and all these difficult times that we're experiencing uh made me understand i think a lot of our customers where we are unique in in the industry in the sense that um in order to move fast in this world and in order to transform your organization and your business faster um, you just need to have less tools you want to like work together uh with the same view uh and that's i think what sets the other apart the ability to scale really fast and adjust quickly and, and seamlessly to your business needs um whether you scale up or sometimes down in in times like this um and bring everybody together with no you know difficult permissions or deployments or um cases where like you need to hire more people right like one of the main benefits of datadog is to take off some of the complexity in running applications in the cloud some of the complexity of monitoring where for example with you know cloud native technologies and ephemeral infrastructure um Trace, like traditional tracing logs and metrics solutions became quickly inefficient. Uh, with Datadog, we really put the focus on the developers. We put the focus on being containers first and cloud agnostic. Um, and we allow our customers to run on any runtime in any types of infrastructure, cloud, and premises, and so forth, using the same tools, the same agent, the same platform. What is it, what is it about Datadog that, um you know, makes it easier for people to manage their cloud environment. Meaning like, so if, if someone stands up an OpenShift environment and they don't have something like Datadog monitoring it, what's the, what's the experience like as opposed to when, when you folks are involved? Yeah, that's a great question, Michael. I think, you know, first of all, most of the companies are kind of still in, in this journey to the cloud and, and that digital transformation to modern architecture and, and you know modern cloud cloud stack. Um, and and that journey is where like we're focusing on the most, right? Traditional solutions not or I think still not support both like legacy and and modern cloud environments, right? With Datadog, um, you basically use the same agent and the same uh, uh, platform uh, for all your infrastructure, all your stack, both your legacy environments, your on-premise environments, and like your cloud ones, regardless on the runtime you're you're using. Um, and I I think that you know just trying to get started with Datadog and being able to like get everything together uh, is is making us really shine uh, and, and really focusing on the experience here, um, right? Like instead of moving away between different tools for monitoring, um, when you do this migration from like legacy or from on-premise to the cloud, you have the ability to like monitor and measure your performance as you're doing this journey, as you're lifting and shifting your architecture, as you're going to multi-cloud architecture and hybrid uh, with the same tool. I don't want to give maybe specific examples yet of traditional tools, but those usually targeted one type of stack or, or the legacy or the cloud, but usually not both. So the focus is really about the user experience. And so it's it's a SaaS offering. So how does that work? There, there's you know you folks have an infrastructure back in in your in your NOC in your data center and there's just an agent that people set up and, and, and run on every different pod or every node or every every server, or how does that work? Yeah, exactly. So first of all, Datalog is a SaaS platform, like you said, for monitoring and security, um, which means that all your monitoring uh, telemetry and data uh, is sent to our cloud. Uh, we are running on multi-cloud, so it's not necessarily a cloud. Uh, we have data centers in different regions in the world. We're running on Google on, on, on Azure and on Azure uh, and AWS, of course. Um, and we have two types of integrations. Uh, we have agent-based integrations, which require using that unified single agent that runs on any runtime that collects metrics, 
logs and traces from within your workloads and containers and, and hosts. Uh, and we also have web integrations and cloud integrations that directly fetch using you know, APIs and public APIs, uh, data from cloud providers and different technologies, um, mainly SaaS and PaaS. Um, we have more than 400 integrations. Um, every day that I check it, we're, we're adding a bit more, um, part of what I also work on with my team. Um, and we basically make it really easy in a single page, which I'll definitely demo you later, um, to add more and more integrations into your uh, Datadog platform. Front. So I, I, I was going to say, so you're, you're going you're gonna to provide a, a demonstration here, and then we're also going to talk later on about your container survey that you folks put out every year, right? So this is, how many years have you been doing this container survey now? Oh, that's a good question. I think that that's about five years, and and it's not exactly like if I can correct you. Like what what what's unique about this this study? I think is the fact that we're really relying on on real data. We're trying to provide uh, visibility to our customers and any anyone in the community to uh, the latest container trends that we're seeing uh, from more than like a billion and a half containers and tens of thousands of customers. Yeah, I was going to say it's probably five years. I know. I know. Um... You guys must have a tremendous amount of telemetry information about the apps. Yeah, that that's an understanding. Running, right? I mean, I mean, isn't that almost like an unfair advantage that you folks have? I mean, you have so many customers that you're managing and monitoring that you guys must have your your you know your fingers on exactly what's running where, when, and how, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, as a product manager, you know, I am trying, and my my colleagues are trying to like build Datadog using like, you know, data-driven approach. We're taking mindful decisions based on, on what we're seeing our customers use where they are. Uh, so that's, that's really helped. Uh, it's a huge advantage, but also, you know, some great responsibility, right? Like we need and we want to stay ahead of those trends, um, such as like, you know, to give an example, uh, our move to Kubernetes uh, happened already started like a few years ago before Kubernetes was even, uh, you know, uh, very popular. Uh, and about a year ago, we, you know, got to a place where we're running 100% of our uh, workloads on Kubernetes. So, you know, taking the risks on betting on new technologies, uh, and Kubernetes is just one example, is uh, another, you know, thing that we're doing, which is, you know, being being there like before our customers and knowing so, kind of like best what, practices. What was it running on before if it wasn't running natively on Kubernetes? Was, was it Was it originally just written for bare metal or something? Yeah, we're running on Dermo. Um, we're running, you know, monolith applications, then running Docker containers, um, and now we're running all these containers in in an orchestrated environment. We have like a uh, a multi, you know, cloud architecture where we have a pretty robust Kubernetes platform that we built ourselves um, that allows, you know, running physical Kubernetes clusters on Dermo, but also and by bare metal, I mean on, on cloud VMs, um, and developers can create their own virtual Kubernetes clusters within those physical clusters, right? So you can think about like child and parent, um, and 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 that really I think amplifies the the benefits of orchestration, right? Which we're focusing a lot on this report uh, that we'll talk about later, as orchestration kind of abstracts the complexity of the cloud from from users uh, with a container first approach, which we're also taking in data. Uh, one of the main benefits is that you can run containers everywhere, right? You can move them everywhere. You can, um, uh, you can, you know, run them in multiple places and, and Kubernetes is, is, is one of those technologies out there that, that abstracts that complexity for you and allows you to move, move containers anywhere. Okay. Well, we we've uh, we we're happy to have you guys on the show here today. I, I, I was expecting I was expecting Elon to be on, but he must, <laughs> be, he must just be a little too busy. He's your VP of marketing. He's usually the guy that we work with. I know, um, you know, we've been working with Datadog now for for many years to to make sure that your that your software runs and runs well with with OpenShift and and our other products and exactly. Is it your you guys have your annual conference down there in New York, although you used to. It was um, Datadog Dash, right? 
Yeah, we have Dash uh, around the summer, uh, which is usually the most exciting event of our company where we are announcing a lot of new products and new features uh, and, and inviting our customers to try them out and hear more about it and talk with us. I, I went you know, down there. Well, of course, I did, we weren't we weren't there this year because of the the challenging times that we're all working in. But I went I was down there last time. It was down in um, down in New York, down on the waterfront there by the piers. And I got to tell you, I mean, it was it was really impressive seeing how many customers were there and, and the the excitement around you know Datadog the platform. Um, and not, not and you know I mentioned this to your marketing people the other day, but it was also probably one of the best trade shows I've been to. Uh, uh, the food was phenomenal. Like it wasn't, like <laughs> the, it wasn't like the little mini sliders, you know, that that are cold and the hamburger bun is stuck onto the on, onto the patty. I mean, it was it was a really well really well run um, event. And, yeah, this uh, is great to hear. We really do. I'm hoping that we're going to be able to get back to in-person events again, and, and I can't Likewise. wait to head back down there. Are you guys planning on having it in, in New York again the next time that, you know, we can all travel and get out? Of course. Hopefully this will be this year, but it doesn't look like, you know, we will, um, all of us, be able to do that. Um, but as soon as things get back to normal, I'm sure that those events will happen again. Is, is, is that because you, your headquarters isn't in New York City, is it, or is it? Uh, my, our what, sorry? Uh, your headquarters. headquarters. Yeah, yeah like, our headquarters are in New York, yeah. By the way, just to mention, like last year, we had a great virtual dash. I think it was a very unique experience for all of us at the Dog, and it was a pretty successful event, even though, you know, we couldn't hand over, like, swags and, and delicious food to our uh, guests and users, unfortunately. Yep. Um, all right, well, anyway, so I was, I was talking about Elon and, and you know, the – the, the reason why we have you folks on the show here today is not because, you know, you're just some random company, but, you know, we, we consider Datadog and, and, and the services that you guys uh, offer are a pretty key workload to helping our customers be successful running, you know, Kubernetes and specifically OpenShift for, for production environments. And um, you folks have a, have a Red Hat certified container, you have a Red Hat certified operator for OpenShift, and I think that you're available in the Red Hat marketplace as well, is that right? That's correct. Okay. And you're a member of our OpenShift Commons community, which I know Diane Mueller is, is very excited about. Um, I don't know if anybody who's listening has, has had an opportunity to meet uh, Diane, but she's like, She's probably she's probably one of the most amazing people and uh, that that I've had the pleasure of working with. Um, she actually is responsible for the OpenShift Commons um, program and all of their events and and those are all over the world. If anyone's ever has a chance to attend one of the Commons briefings, they're they're pretty terrific. Um, anyway, so we have uh, a demonstration that you're going to show us about you know what it is, how it works. Uh, what do you what do you need? Do we need a drum roll or uh, <laughs> what, what do we need to set the stage for for what you can show us here today? Yeah, you're. Um, I just can go ahead and give you a quick demo. Definitely, I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and share my screen then. Are we ready? I think I think we're ready. I think we're ready to roll. Sounds great. Um, if you just give me one second, I'm going to start sharing my screen. Can you see it all right? I can. I can see your screen. Fantastic. Cool. So um, we'll do a quick demo here. Uh, again, this is Datalog. For those who haven't seen it before, Datalog is a SaaS monitoring and security platform that combines your metrics, traces, and logs in a single place uh, to enable visibility across any kind of stack for all teams and stakeholders. Uh, this means that everyone, devs, ops, security teams, are able to break down silos and collaborate more efficiently. So what we're looking at here is a dashboard uh, used to bring in critical data, um, such as metrics, logs, and traces uh, across your environment in a single view. Uh, this specific dashboard is for our demo app, Shopist, which we'll use in for this demo, uh, which basically powers a, an e-commerce retailer that we've set up. 
Um, as you can see, it's showing key information about our application, such as system health, uptime, uh, and to more advanced things like you know, synthetics, uh, network performance, and, and real user monitoring um, tests. Um, you asked me before, Michael, about our integrations, right? So we have the agent, we have cloud integrations. You can see about like 400 and plus integrations in this screen. Each of them enables you to quickly set them up user using uh, very few steps. Um, our agent, you know, supports Kubernetes and OpenShift uh, as well as all the other like types of infrastructure and runtimes. Uh, it's a single agent that usually can be deployed in like one or two steps. So once you set up some integrations uh, in your um, environment, uh, each of these integration comes out with some out of the box dashboards. For example, this is one of our many out-of-the-box dashboards for Kubernetes, where you can see an overview of your Kubernetes clusters and OpenShift as well. Um, once your integrations are set up, you can also take a look at your infrastructure. For example, here we're seeing all the hosts uh, or, and the VMs. We can use tags to like group them and slice and dice, for example, uh, such as cloud provider uh, in availability zone and choose any metric um, to color them. For example, uh, we can choose user CPU and notice that there is one uh, instance here that is in, that is pretty busy and drill down to understand what is running and, and what it might be. Uh, if we want to switch to containers, uh, we can also take a look at all our live containers, including our Kubernetes and OpenShift workloads, right? Here, for example, I'm using, again, a tag, which is the cluster name, to group all my pods, right? So I can quickly get an aggregated view of how many of them are in each state, for example, those that are in crush the back off. And with a single click, I can drill into the specific pod, uh, look at all the containers that are running in it, and correlate between logs, if I have any errors, metrics that are specific to my pod, uh, or container, processes are running in it, as well as uh, network data, traces, for performance, and and more. Uh, so here, can I just can I just jump in here for a sec? I I, I did want to uh, I did want to to say to the people who may be watching and listening, um, you know, we're live on we're live on YouTube, we're live on uh, Facebook, uh, as well as Twitch, and 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 certainly our bridge here. If anyone has any questions, uh, we'd like to. We'd like to play uh, stump the product manager here today. Um, there, there's, there's. Uh, I wanted to share the screen because I have something really. Can I, may I share the screen for one second, Yair? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'm stopping mine. Yeah, I'm gonna. Uh, I'm gonna share now. Can you see my screen? I see this beautiful shirt. Yes. <clears throat> we're. we're we're going to play stump the product manager. Um, <laughs> if anyone has a question and they can they can stump the IEAR about something that's specific to uh, to his area of expertise, we're 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 making up these these T-shirts that I think um, everybody can everybody can uh, relate to these days. You get the can you see my screen and and the you're on mute edition here. Um, so <laughs> if anyone has any any questions for year. Um, please put them in the chat, and then we'll we'll get you one of our one of our new uh, 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 challenging times T-shirts. Right. Sorry. Thanks, Michael. And, and and you know, since we're uh, very uh, interested in getting any questions, I'll just maybe quickly explain what my area of what my domain of focus or expertise in Datadog. Right. So. Um, I'm the product manager for containers, which uh, means a bunch of things. Uh, first of all, you know, focusing on making Datadog a container-first platform, which means you know, with ephemeral uh, workloads such as containers and, and infrastructure, uh, the ability to like basically run everywhere uh, on any runtime, as well as like you know, the challenges that modern uh, um, cloud stack provides. We um, really like focusing on making those challenges disappear when you use Datadog. For example, right, like with the number of um, workloads and containers and microservices 
uh, the tagging or the number of, of signals and how you classify them explodes by an order of magnitude. And one of the things we're working on with data, in Datadog is on making it easy to like control that cost, that that cardinality, right? So you can control uh, um, uh, those metric tags, you can control the traces uh, and the logs that you index and so forth. The other thing is uh, my team and I are working on different Kubernetes open source projects to contribute to the community, such as our extended daemon set and the data operator, uh, our water pod, watermark, for other scaler and, and so forth that I can talk about later. So we're trying to like build developer tools to make um, monitoring Kubernetes and other environments um, easy. Um, the other thing is that, of course, we work with the major cloud providers, different CNCF projects on um, monitoring those with our integrations. Um, and lastly, we're working on all the different open source uh, standards um, to keep our customers you know, uh, where they are, to help them where they are and, and keep them from vendor login. Looking, you know, such as like open metrics, standards, um, Prometheus, open telemetry, and so forth. So that's kind of my area. Uh, should we go back to I, Michael? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I didn't mean to interrupt. Well, actually, I did mean to interrupt, but I, I, I do want to offer up these these shirts. I think they're I think they're pretty cool. So uh, I want one. Stump, stump, we're gonna we're gonna send some down. We're gonna have some co-branded with Datadog Red Hat, and, and we'll send some down to to you guys as well. Um, so stump the product manager challenge starts today. And, and having said that, uh, I'll, uh, please resume with your demo and I won't interrupt you again. I promise. Maybe. No problem at all, Micah. Feel free to let me know if there are any questions from the, our audience today. Cool. So, you know, we kind of like looked at the host and the containers in the infrastructure, right? Um, the next thing I want to move to is, um, our APM services. So we're now looking at the service map and. You know, in today's paradigm of microservices, where like, you know, we run a lot of different, num like we, we run a high number of different services, uh, it can be difficult to keep uh, on top of dependencies between them. So what we're seeing here is a map of all our services, um, and we can understand how each of the services behaves with any, uh, you know, request that it receives. For example, if I have uh, an incident and I uh, wake up in the middle of the night, I can quickly understand where the service that has uh, a latency or a high error rate and which other services uh, might be impacted based on these different uh, dependencies between them and the communication. Um, we'll switch to the traces, uh, sorry, we'll switch to the service page uh, of one of those services that we just saw, the web store. Um, here you can see an overview of all the um, uh, basically the application performance of the service web store. Uh, for example, we can see um, the requests that the service is receiving um, where each color uh, represents a different version, as well as like the latency, which I can choose from uh, and many other things. Um, and those cool things such as like compare like the performance of my recent version to the previous one. Uh, and understand if there is any difference in maybe an application bug introduced a higher error rate and investigate this really quickly. All the way down to the infrastructure itself, right? So for example, the service is running on Kubernetes and we can see all the containers, how many pods are running there, how much CPU they use and so forth. Uh, so all this information is received by uh, the Datadog agent what the, that collects like traces and sends them to Datadog. Here we can see basically all the traces that are received. And I can, for example, um, use one of those tags to filter the traces to only um, show me errors in the payment that are like of type payment uh, service unavailable, right? Let's click on one of those traces, one of these application requests. Uh, and as you can see with this flame graph, I can quickly understand all the services that were involved all the way down to the payment API that received an error. Look how also easy it is to quickly pivot between infrastructure metrics, logs, uh, and so forth. Um, one of the nice things that we added, again, when we think about container first, um, is the ability to get all your traces with no filtering, no sampling uh, in live for the past 
15 minutes. Those are extremely helpful when you're like troubleshooting an issue in production uh, where you don't really need to like uh, index and store those traces for a long time, but you write, just want to understand what's going on at, at a specific time. Yeah, I, I, have a, I have a question for you. So um, in, a, in a distributed computing environment, people notice that, you know, there's something wrong or that there's, you know, something's consuming too many, you know, processes or, so, you know, something's consuming too much memory. How does Datadog help with affecting a change to fix that? Or is it just purely monitoring? I mean, Datadog uh, does not roll changes to your own applications. It just, you know, receives telemetry from these applications. What Datadog does is it makes it very easy to detect issues and to also investigate and understand the root cause that they happen. So the application developers or any other users can, you know, get their applications back and running uh, as quickly as possible, right? For example, um, if I deploy, you know, if we go back to um, my page, right? I can look at my deployments. Let's filter them to show a specific app that is deployed to multiple clusters in different regions, right? I can use this screen in real time to, when I roll out a new version, um, go see how the rollout performs, if there are any errors, if all the replicas are up and running as expected, to view metrics and logs, and so forth, right? Once the application is up and running, I can use the uh, application performance monitoring to compare between these versions, right? So I can, for example, open the active version, compare it to the previous one and see if there are any higher number of errors, which I can then uh, compare and look into to investigate what the issue is. Uh, there are, of course, also monitors um, that I can set up to automatically detect me when an error rate goes up or when my replicas are not available and so forth to really, you know, reduce the time for detection and reduce the time for investigating. Um, so moving forward, right, we're looking at the logs here of this application uh, request that returned an error from the payment service. Um, and I can now, now move to our logs product to uh, quickly look at this log. As you can see, the log itself, each log message is tagged with all my infrastructure um, tags, uh, as well as my application ones, um, with the trace that allows me to understand what happened before this log line. Um, and, you know, with the logs, one of the nice things that we have here, uh, in addition to exactly the abilities to filter and group by different tags, is also the ability to understand what happens, right? Uh, when I look at application logs, they're very usually noisy. If I don't know exactly what I'm looking for, it's hard to understand and find what I need. With this patterns detection, I can quickly identify repetitive patterns um, that Datadog automatically discovers and help me, you know, understand if there are any outliers or specific issues that I can quickly look into. Um, similarly to like uh, our application performance monitoring that allows me to send traces without limits, uh, our logs product does that as well. I can change to Lifetail where I can see any logs that are received in my environment by, by any containers and any cloud services that I'm using. Uh, those logs are not indexed, so they're very cheap. And I, we, you know, we build this because we understand that, you know, some logs you need to keep and store and index, um, which you can control and choose, and some are not that important. But in case of an incident, they can be extremely important, right? So with the Lifetail, you get all the logs without limits available to you. Um, lastly, let's move to our security product. Um, our security monitoring product allows you to automatically detect uh, issues. We, co we, we collect and store those security signals that uh, Datadog detects for up to 12 months, I think. Um, so you can really understand the patterns in your environment and keep it safe. Here we're looking at one security signal for an account takeover uh, with a brute force attempt. Um, and we can get like a message that also tells us like how to triage and respond it. Lastly, I wanna show Watchdog. Watchdog is a page that shows you a feed 
of all the things, all the unusual things that you would less likely to detect yourself. Um, we're using some machine learning and, and advanced algorithms to identify any issues in your services. For example, we're looking at a watchdog story in one of our MongoDB database databases that show us uh, a higher error rate for some queries at a specific time. Um, and, and we can quickly create a data log monitor um, that will notify us uh, with alerts via Slack or any other like notification system that you have about this the next time it happens. <clears throat> so I'm gonna finish here and see if we have any questions before we move on to our container report. I, I know I know I have a question. So what what size what size clusters are you folks monitoring out there? I mean, are we talking, you know Ooh. like any kind of size. We have a lot of customers. Some of them are small and medium. Some of them are very large. I can tell you that we run some of the biggest class, Kubernetes clusters, I think, in the world. Um, and I'm talking about thousands and, and more uh, of nodes per cluster. So how, how do you deal with configuration management then? And, and, you know, so if your agent needs to be deployed on every node that stood up, how do your customers manage you know updates and changes to the data dog agent that's running on those nodes and, and and keeping everything in sync that's a great question um you know we're as i said like we're trying to stay agnostic to any cloud technologies any cloud tools our customers use you know uh a huge variety of tools that we support right some of them for example adopted the GitOps approach where they keep everything in a source control and with CI CD deploy changes. Um, and our agent you know, provides help chart and, and, and uh, an operator where you can keep those manifests of YAML files in your source control and deploy them across multiple nodes and multiple clusters. Uh, with Kubernetes, of course, and OpenShift, we use the daemon set approach uh, where the daemon set basically updates uh, the data of agent pod on each of your nodes. We also support Ansible, Chef, recipes where like you know, people use uh, uh, VMs uh, directly and deploy the agent on that. So, you know, the, the goal is like to create a single agent that provides you, uh, you know, you can find everything in our documentation, which I can show later, um, support for any CI, CD and, and configuration management tools that you have. Okay. And, and does everybody run this? Um, in the cloud, I mean, or, or are there people who say, well, sorry, but our, our policies are that we, we don't want anything outside of our own infrastructure. So can, can people use Datadog on site? Do you have something other than a SaaS model? We do not have anything other than SaaS model, but we do provide a lot of capabilities that allow customers to securely and, and efficiently monitor their on-premise clusters. Um, you know, we, we basically, you know, these features include things like um, uh, automatic uh, um, reduction of data uh, and scrambling of sensitive data uh, using like log processors um, to remove any sensitive information. Uh, usually metrics are not that sensitive, but we also provide them capabilities to like remove tags and things like that. Um, but the point is that, you know, even if you're running on premise, um, you can keep all your sensitive information and, and you can keep your applications running there, but you still want a unified and reliable monitoring solution in the cloud. Um, I can tell you that we have a lot of different types of customers from you know, different industries and verticals, and some of them are, uh, for example, financial customers with the most strict compliance requirements that you know, they use Datadog and we work with them to meet those requirements. Um, our Datadog agent, you know, provides you all these capabilities to like customize and control what is being sent, what is being delivered. Um, and, and I think this specifically for monitoring, right? Like the SaaS, uh, having a reliable SaaS platform is really one of the main reasons to choose data in the first place. I, I was just curious, because I would imagine that there's some companies who are extremely paranoid about, you know, maybe there's some government agencies or, you know, the IRS or, or you know, yeah, well, you know, we have different solutions. Uh, for example, we, we are working, um, and I think we announced like a, a cloud for, uh, like a cloud offering for uh, government customers, um, right? So, so that kind of 
cloud that we build for the government customers is isolated from our public cloud offerings and is more secured uh, in, in some ways or it meets different compliant needs. Does that make sense? Sure. Okay. Uh, so we said earlier that you were going to talk about the results of your survey. You put out a survey every year. I think it was it, com it comes out in October or November, right? Right. Uh, we're usually re usually releasing the the report during KubeCon, United yep. States, North America. Yep. And and so this survey you put out is 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 a status of of container adoption within what's the sample size? It must be about at least a hundred different sites that provide information for this, right? Yeah, I mean, for the report we're using, um, we're basically examining more than 1.5 billion containers uh, that run by- Sorry, did you say 1.5, you said 1.5 million? Billion, nine zeros. Oh, with a B, okay. With a B. I actually, I actually knew that, I was just trying to tee it up. <laughs> right, uh, yeah, that's a lot of data as you can imagine. Um, we have a really talented data science teams that helped us like producing this report and, and finding all these trends that we published every year. Okay. And so you're gonna we're gonna go over the one that you folks published this published this past year. Correct. Okay. Yeah. So uh, one of you know the first trend that we wanted to start with is about Kubernetes. Kubernetes of course uh, has a lot of flavors uh, such as OpenShift. Um, and our finding shows that about more than 50% of um, the containers are now running in Kubernetes. That's pretty pretty exciting uh, to see the rapid and the steady rise of Kubernetes. As opposed to running on what? So before you know using Kubernetes or Kubernetes is an orchestration platform, right? Which, as I mentioned before, like kind of abstracts. Um, some of the complexity of the cloud and managing the, the infrastructure. Uh, before that, uh, you know, organizations still used containers, or in some cases they have not yet. They, they ran monolith applications and they deploy them directly on the machines themselves, right? So you need to say, I am going to run this container or this application on host X or Y. With Kubernetes, things are changing, uh, and and you know, basically the orchestration is responsible for scheduling those containers on your behalf, uh, on your infrastructure. Uh, one of, you know, for example, the, the changes in terms of like the, the user experience or the behavior is that the application teams do not need to even know or care much about the infrastructure or where they are deploying, whether it's in cluster X or cloud provider Y, uh, but instead they just, you know, tell Kubernetes, I want to run these applications and Kubernetes goes to that soup of machines and runs them. Um, before Kubernetes, to also complement this answer, there were other uh, orchestration service, services, right? One of the most popular orchestration services from what we see is Amazon ECS, which you know provides a simpler way to kind of run containers in terms of like you know the different types of options that you can customize comparing to Kubernetes. And Amazon also was one of the first companies that released a managed orchestra orchestration platform uh, that became super popular. Fair enough. All right. Um, so fact number two was uh, that by now we see that 90% of the containers are orchestrated. Um, that means again that all these Docker containers and now we're seeing you know, the, the rise, uh, the increased popularity of also other container runtimes, um, those are just managed by an orchestration such as Kubernetes or ECS. Um, moving forward, this was a pretty surprising fact, right? Um, what we found was that um, the majority of the workloads that are being deployed to Kubernetes um, are not utilizing CPU and memory efficiently. So, for example, with CPU, you can see that about um, less than 10% of all the containers, um, sorry, about 30% of all the containers are using less than 10%, or 49% of the containers are using less than 30. Uh, with memory, uh, we've seen a similar case. And that's kind of like counterintuitive to, you know, Kubernetes being able to beam pack and automatically schedule containers in the most efficient way. Um, and there are several reasons that, you know, 
we, we explain and I can talk about quickly for why this is currently happening, right? Um, one of them has to do with how the journey to Kubernetes looks like, right? Um, most companies had their own applications that they ran before Kubernetes and kind of the first phase of this journey to Kubernetes or to orchestration is more like a lift and shift of your applications to Kubernetes. During this process, like you really try to preserve high performance. You want to scale, especially during, you know, this, this month, the past year where like, you know, we see the digital transformation accelerating. Um, and you do not want to, for example, risk your application being like umkilled or throttled by, you know, Linux. Um, um, so that's kind of like the first phase, right? Um, the other thing is that when you think about where customers that we work with are now, um, they're, most of them are relatively new to like running Kubernetes. And we think that now that, you know, in the next year we'll see the, the focus shifting to like from, from performance, like now that performance is good and scale is automatic scaling is working to um, cost optimization. Uh, which basically means utilizing the CPU and memory, which are usually one of the major, some of the major expense factors um, in running cloud uh, services and applications. Mm -hmm. I, I was going to say, so what, you know, what's the ideal number? I would think it would be somewhere around, you probably want to be sitting around 80%, right? Ish. Exactly. Yeah. And, you know, if you think about it, right, uh, if you already have, your, uh, you know, applications before, you know, moving to Kubernetes, like those were not necessarily monolith, but they were composite of a relatively few or small number of services. Um, with Kubernetes, you basically need to specify for each container how much CPU and memory it uses, or, you know, that's the requests. Um, the problem is that if you have very large containers, um, and you want to schedule them or bin pack them efficiently on nodes, uh, there is a certain amount of con large containers that you could, you know, bin pack on a on on a on a single node. Um, the reason I'm mentioning it is because another trend, which we'll you know show a little later in this report, is about the move to microservices or the adoption of microservices. Microservices, you know, basically is an application architecture where you have a high number of services, a high number of containers uh, that are smaller, and you know. Kind of like if you try to take a lot of small stones and put them, uh, you know, in a glass, you'll probably have less air left. Rather, if you, uh, you know, try to put a, lot of, a few large stones in in a ball, right? That will have a lot of gaps in between. So, so that's kind of what we're seeing in play here. And we believe that, you know, as cus as companies move more towards like microservices and service mesh architectures. Um, that would also increase and improve the utilization in cloud resources on Kubernetes. So that that kind of like captures um, what we've seen here. It's pretty pretty interesting. Um, let's scroll down a little bit um, and talk about Fargate, right? So Fargate is a compute system or or service by AWS um, that allows you to run containers. Uh, on a serverless compute platform. So it basically abstracts or removes the need to like manage and, and, and use hosts. Um, as you can see in this report, like we've seen Fargate increasing, uh, to about, uh, more than 30%. It's a pretty high number of, of usage of serverless containers in a single like service such as Fargate. Um, pretty exciting. You know, serverless containers, I think will unlock a lot of use cases and benefits over the next few years. And, you know, worth mentioning here that Fargate is probably a good representation for a lot of other like serverless uh, compute platforms uh, and orchestration platforms um, that we will see that they are a bit more in their nascent than like Fargate, which has, you know, been released I think a few years ago, um, but will become popular as well, right? Even OpenShift and IBM have a bunch of like serverless containers, services, um, such as OpenShift services, serverless, sorry, um, that are using Knative, which is a really interesting technology as well. And and serverless containers are, are especially interesting because um, containers are already ephemeral and a host, you know, is is not 
something that you tear down every second, right? So having the ability to scale up and down your containers and run them with without any infrastructure, like completely abstracting them away, uh, makes a lot of sense uh, in many interesting use cases. Um, so, so that that was that was about the serverless. Michael, let me know if there are any questions or if you'd like to ask me anything. Um, I, I was just I was just pinging uh, Chris Short to see how we're doing on time. I think he said we can go over a little bit if we need to. Sounds good. How much more time do we have? Ten minutes, maybe. Uh, about about five. Sounds good. Um, so a couple of more trends here, right? Um, Kubernetes, no size, um, oh. as we can see in this fact. I'm sorry, uh, uh, Chris said we can actually run over, so we're, we're good. Cool. Um, Kubernetes node sizes in Kubernetes um, are changing as clusters become larger. What we found is that in small clusters, um, the use of small nodes is pretty common still, but as you look at and move towards larger clusters, those small nodes kind of disappear, and we see more like larger nodes with 60 nodes or more. Um, and of course, that includes 32, 64, and even more. Um, that actually makes a lot of sense because, um, you know, when you run a Kubernetes node, you have um, kind of like a sunk cost of processes such as the kernel, the hypervisor, uh, the container runtime as well as Kubernetes specific components like the kubelet that take resources that are expensive um, and, and those basically do not scale linearly when you use larger nodes, right? Um, because you can run a lot of those containers on a single large node um, and your allocatable uh, uh, CPU and memory resources are just increasing. Um, the other thing is that with Kubernetes, um, you know, having a failure in a node is less of an issue. Um, and with, you know, large clusters that have 1,000 and more nodes, uh, the failure of a single node is probably not going to uh, have a severe impact on performance, which is something that, cost, you know, organizations are um, starting to accept more and more. So, so that's pretty exciting. Um, and the next one is about networking technologies. Um, Kubernetes is doing a great job in abstracting, you know, abstracting the cloud uh, complexity. But one of the things that you know are sometimes left to the application developers and the platform engineers is, you know, managing the networking between between containers. That complexity also increases as the number of containers increasing. Um, you know, the main the main technologies. Um, that um, deal with, you know, container networking and security, as you can see here, help containers to discover each other and really simplifies the, that, that communication for the uh, application developers themselves. Um, one of the interesting findings that we had was that, um, while Calico, uh, which is a great networking technology, is the most popular, we see a lot of other technologies um, and this segmentation, uh, this this diversification shows us that you know this is an area which uh, no one is yet dominating in, and will be very interesting to see uh, you know what happens in the next few years. Uh, we believe at Datadog that the number of technologies for networking, uh, um, uh, you know, container networking and, and security um, will continue to increase. We have some technologies such as you know, Nginx and Istio that are super popular and used by, you know, for example, Istio is used by Red Hat and a lot of other companies such as Google um, to build like service meshes. Um, and and that's that, that's something that we don't think will, will change anytime soon. Um, so related to networking technologies, and I think by that we will uh, maybe wrap up the container report. We also published a fact about the service mesh adoption. Uh, service mesh technology, um, you know, is is really used as an abstraction to the application networking um, for 
applications that consist of a lot of small containers or, or small services. Um, the um, infrastructure layer of the application networking is not solved today by Kubernetes, right? So if you're using, for example, an AWS cloud, you might want to use AWS VPC for networking, right? But if you're running your containers on other runtimes, such as on-premise or like in virtual clusters, uh, the, the underlying network infrastructure might be different. Uh, that's one of the core uh, um, benefits and promises of service mesh technologies, um, which is really exciting. However, what we found in this report is that while a lot of companies comparing to our last year uh, report um, are now experimenting and trying service mesh technologies, um, but you know the adoption is still early. If you look at how many containers, sorry, how many organizations uh, are actually running the majority of the workloads using service mesh technology, uh, those numbers are still relatively low. Um, and when we were, our, when we were when we were talking about this the other day, um, I, I basically admitted that I'm no expert on service mesh, but is this because um, the sizes of the containers are rather large, comparatively speaking, and that you know service mesh adoption is going to probably increase when uh, the containers get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and just millions and millions more of them or? Exactly. Uh, I think that that is the core the core reason. Um, con most containers um, are still relatively large, um, and when you're using services architecture, like not microservices architecture, services architecture, which is still more, way more popular, uh, you already have solutions uh, that provide you some of those main benefits that service meshes do, such as, for example, blue red canary deployments. Right? Um, you could use like an ingress controller such as such as nginx uh, to route traffic between uh, different application versions or different uh, uh, you know replicas of services. Uh, however, it, once you move to like microservices architecture and the number of services is growing by you know an order of two or three uh, to thousands of microservices, right? Um, an ingress controller, which is more like a centralized uh, way to route traffic is no longer uh, very scalable or, or granular enough for that. Um, and we think that, you know, as the number of services that, cost, that organizations run will increase, service mesh adoption will uh, follow as well. Fair enough. Cool. I don't know if we have time for one more or like, do we want to wrap up? I'll leave no, it to I, you. I, I think we do. This is good stuff. We, we've, got, we've got time. Sounds good. Um, so one of our last facts was focused on about the most uh, popular technologies that are running in containers today. Uh, not a lot of new surprises here since the dominating technologies are still Nginx, Redis, and Postgres, but we had a few uh, um, newcomers, right? Um, I think one of the interesting ones is Vault that came up 10th, I think, um, in terms of the order. Vault is a really exciting uh, technology by HashiCorp that allows uh, um, you know, application developers and platform engineers to keep um, any you know secrets and passwords uh, safe. Um, you know, for environments like production, where basically each workload carries an identity and fetches them from uh, you know the secure vault uh, during the deployment and and the, the continuous integration and deployment. Um, and and related to that, we saw that in Kubernetes specifically and OpenShift. Um, the top container images that are running in stateful sets. Uh, stateful sets are stateful applications that require some persistent of state. Um, um, we found that out that you know those are uh, databases or you know data services such as Redis, Elasticsearch, Postgres, and, and that's pretty interesting, I think, uh, given that you know Kubernetes in its early days was not very friendly uh, to run those technologies. Uh, a couple of things change over the years. Of course, dozens of hundreds of improvements to Kubernetes, but also a lot of support that came from those open source technologies and, and the commercial vendors that, that also maintain them uh, to make them easily easier to run on Kubernetes as well. Uh, that may also makes a lot of sense because for organizations who use Kubernetes, you know, the benefits of running 
all your services, including the data that connects all of them together in a single cluster, in a single environment, in a single network, uh, is, is obviously important a lot. So it makes a lot of sense for, you know, that now we see all of those technologies uh, are becoming popular, uh, which means that, you know, the, the journey to, to orchestration uh, and to Kubernetes uh, is, is safer and, and more predictable. Great, Pre uh, Michael, I think that we, we hit the mark on that report. I, I think so. I think so. Um, and that comes out every year, right? So, so yes. uh, the next one's going to be coming out uh, November-ish. Exactly. Uh, what, what, do you, what, do you, what are your predictions? I mean, as I said, right, we think that more and more customers uh, and, and organizations will, you know, move to uh, Kubernetes and, and, and the different flavors of Kubernetes, like OpenShift and, and all those. We think that serverless containers are becoming uh, more popular this year. Um, I think that, you know, with service meshes, um, as microservices architecture is becoming the more, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, recommended approach for cloud native applications where you want to run containers everywhere, uh, microservices will, you know, adoption will increase as well as service meshes. Um, and you know, last thing is about security, right? Um, a lot of these technologies are, are are meant and built and designed for containers, and they you know kind of support the uh, the security requirements that that running containerized applications in scale have. Um, so so that would probably be another major factor. We see a lot of open source and commercial solution, solutions for securing containers and. I'm pretty excited to see uh, what would be the dominated technologies uh, in a year from now. Okay, well, we'll, we'll find out. We'll find out. Um, Datadog, ladies and gentlemen. So, yeah, you guys have a free trial. Uh, if people want to use the free trial, we have it here on the screen. Um, yep. You can't, can't click on it, but you can type that in. And uh, thanks for coming. Um, yeah, yeah. It was, uh, it was so really good having you guys on. I know, I know that uh, you know you guys are a great partner of ours, and you know, thanks for being on the show. Um, looking forward to having you folks back again in the near future. Likewise, it's always great. Thank you very much, Michael. Okay, wonderful. Everybody, have a great rest of your day.